the child's dietary intake, it's very important we pay close attention to the key nutrients. And these are the nutrients that may impact on growth, the nutrients that we may know run low in our populations, and the nutrients that we know are important in playing their role for cognitive development. Next slide. Golden and colleagues um, first identified these two types of nutrients, type 1 nutrients, those which a deficiency uh, results in clinical symptoms, but there is no impact on growth, and type 2 nutrients, where these are required as essential growth factors, and where we may not see clear signs of deficiencies in the app, but we may see poor, poor growth uh, rates. Next slide. And so Golden went on to describe how we need to consider for optimal management of children, we have to consider the micronutrients, particularly those type 2 nutrients, that will allow optimal catch-up growth to take place. Next slide, please. So not only do we need to consider the nutrients that are essential for growth, we also need to take interest in those nutrients which we know in our populations are currently low. This is data of, um, predominantly from the FITS study. And what we see here is the prevalence of low intakes of calcium, iron and zinc across different international populations. And this, of course, should draw us within these populations to pay close attention to those nutrients. So, for example, in the Philippines, there is a high prevalence of children not achieving their calcium and iron. In China, there's a high population not achieving calcium. And in my own population in the UK, there's a high prevalence of inadequate intakes of iron in the toddler age group. Next slide, please. So having an awareness of our own population's key nutrients is absolutely key. And we recognize, of course, from the recent data published in Indonesia just in the last few months, about the high prevalence of low ferritin levels, for example, in children um, at 12 months, highlighting for us that in children with faltering growth, this is a key nutrient to consider. Next slide, please. And of course, these are key nutrients because in the time frame of infant and child growth, it is not just physical growth that is occurring, but cognitive development and brain development too. And of course, we increasingly understand the role of certain micronutrients like iron and zinc for myelination, and therefore these should be our focus. Next slide. So as you've heard from the previous excellent speaker, iron is a key nutrient that we need to consider. Next slide, please. And we know that there is a cause and effect relationship between iron status and normal cognitive development. And we also know that there is a key relationship between iron, not just with cognition, but with impacting growth during the whole life frame of the child growing. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at those key nutrients, we just need to remember from the SPGAN guideline that the optimal assessment of nutrient intake, such as iron and zinc, requires not just a biochemical marker, but an assessment of their dietary intake and a clinical examination too. Next slide, please. So I've hopefully been able to show you that a comprehensive assessment, the A, B, C, D approach, allows for a holistic and a great overview of nutritional status. And that when we're doing this assessment, we need to consider calories and micronutrients in faltering growth. Now I want to go on and describe for you several case studies of children who were picked up through screening, who were then subsequently assessed by us, and I'll share with you that assessment and then what we did with these children. Next slide, please. So this first case I have for you is a three-year-old child who was referred with concerns with growth and intake. And this child was described as a picky eater. 
that before we even saw this child, we understood this child had difficulties with fussy eating or picky eating. Next slide, please. Now, we understand that this concept of picky eating in children at this age group is very common. And we saw this from Taylor's uh, review of prevalence of picky eating in 2015. And we've seen more data shown in the black boxes that have been added since then, including data from the third world and from the Middle East and more increasing data from Southeast Asia too. So picky eating, we know, is a big issue in children of this age group. Next slide. And we also know that it is a big concern for the families of the children we see. This work from Singapore identified 83% of parents were concerned at the impact it would have on growth, and over half were concerned at the impact it would have on the child's mental health. So we saw this child to do their assessment. You can see the child's anthropometric measurements here of their weight and their height, and you can see them plotted on the chart that we see on the left. Next slide, please. If we use the WHO anthropometric calculator, you can see this child has a weight of a height of minus 1.8. And as we know from the WHO, this fits just above the category for wasted patient diagnosis. Next slide, please. Within the UK, of course, the most important thing we look for is that trend of growth. And you can see here, looking at the child's growth pattern, that this child has drifted down the centiles over the last six months. Next slide. And you can see, of course, if we look at height, this has been maintained at a normal height growth. So using our national guidelines, the NICE guidelines, this child has shown a fall across more than two centiles over this period with a normal birth weight. So this is indicative for us that an intervention may be required. Next slide, please. So next we looked at um, the biochemical markers. Uh, next slide, please. And, oh sorry, the BMI. Uh, which was also low, and in the UK we use uh, cutoffs of less than the second centile. Next slide, please. So we did look at some biochemical markers for this child. You can see this child came back with a low iron, a low zinc, and a low vitamin D. You will see what was important it was checking the CRP, the ESR, and the albumin, which were all normal, which allows us more confidence of the accuracy of these nutritional bloods. And vitamin D we know is very low commonly in my population, and I see from recent work it's also uh, very common uh, internationally as well. Next slide, please. Clinically, this child had no underlying chronic condition. The child was not only medication that might alter their nutritional intake, and the child had none of the red flags that we looked for. Next slide. So we now look at the D, the dietary intake. Now this child had a three-day diet assessed using a, a standard nutritional program, and this identified low calorie intake, low iron, low zinc, and low iodine. Next slide, please. I think what's important to remember when we're doing assessments, no matter how specific and how detailed, it's also very important to look at how the child eats, not just what they eat. So specifically, we mean looking at the environment that the child is feeding in, looking at the parents and how they feed their child, and looking at the behaviours of others too. Next slide. So the actions we undertook for this child was to start an oral supplement for this child. Next slide, please. Here we see the European guideline key reference again. It sets out criteria where we may consider nutritional support. And highlighted in yellow are the factors that were present in this clinical case. This child, as we saw, had insufficient oral intake from their assessment and had a change in weight for age over two growth channels on their growth chart. 
Next slide, please. So we also see the recommendation again for locally that we consider an oral supplement where we've tried other interventions, which we had in this case, and it failed. Next slide, please. There is good evidence that we see of a positive impact on oral supplements in children with picky eating. It's data from 2003 in Taiwan and the Philippines, and then more recently this data from China, suggesting that the addition of an oral supplement to nutritional counselling can obtain the best outcomes in terms of weight and height. Next slide, please. So the actions we took were to start the oral supplement, to give dietary advice on improving sources of iron and zinc and iodine, and giving behaviour advice too to manage the picky eating. And by able to give the parents of the oral supplement, it allowed them to worry less about what the child was eating and concentrate more on managing the child's difficult behaviours. Next slide, please. Why did we give them a calorie per meal feed? Well, this child only had moderate growth issues and there was no immediate time pressure to catch up with growth. Slide. Because if we look at one of the most recent, uh, next slide please, most recent assessments, a longitudinal outcome study of picky eating children undertaken in the UK, we see that picky eating children actually still grow long term just as well as those children who were not picky. So there is little urgency for catch-up in this case. Next slide, please. So if we move on, we considered follow-up. Our guidelines would suggest that the frequency of the follow-up should follow based on the age, but also take into account our level of concern. And in this case, we chose to follow these guidelines and review this child monthly as more frequent weighing may be adding to the parental anxiety. Next slide, please. So, six months later, we followed this child up and we saw the child had a positive improvement in their weight, maintained their height centile, the behaviours had improved with the picky eating, and we were able to reassess the child and re remove the supplements that were no longer required for that patient. Next slide, please. So the next case study I want to share with you is a two-year-old boy who was diagnosed with a neuroblastoma, who had very poor intake, uh, and who was awaiting surgery. Next slide, please. So we begin the same starting point of our A, B, C, D approach, looking at their basic anthropometry. Next slide. And you can see plotted on the growth chart, uh, we can see that this child had a relatively positive centile position in terms of uh, height. Next slide, please. Well, you can see the child's weight is on the very last centile position. Next slide. Looking at their Z scores, you can see this child had minus 2.8 for their weight for height. And of course, uh, when we look at height for age and BMI for age, these all appear to be very low, indicative of quite more severe, severe uh, undernutrition. Next slide, please. We undertook tricep skin fold thickness uh, in this patient, particularly because of we're aware of the rates of muscle mass loss in this diagnosis. This child plotted on a low tricep skin fold thickness. Next school. Next slide. What we see uh, in the next slide is the biochemical markers for this patient. Uh, next slide, please. Of the growth pattern that you see here. So the child had previously tracked a good weight centile, but their weight loss is acute. And we can see their height trajectory is maintained. Next slide, please. So again, for the UK guidelines, a fall across more than two centile spaces would be where we would be concerned. Next slide, please. BMI was the second centile, but again, we need to consider this child is small for age in terms of their height. Next slide, please. 
Biochemically, the child had low iron and low zinc. But interestingly, this child had a high CRP at the time these bloods were taken. So we do need to be cautious in how we assess and interpret these nutritional markers. And therefore, the decision was made to retest these again when the CRP had come down. Next slide, please. Looking clinically, we know the diagnosis of this child, and we considered the clinical symptoms that would impact the child's intake. The child had nausea, a low appetite, low energy, and high stress levels. All of these playing a negative role to optimizing nutritional intake. Next slide. An assessment of their calorie intake showed a low calorie intake, 400 calorie deficit, low protein and low iron and low zinc. Next slide, please. So we decided to provide them with a 1.5 calorie per mil oral supplement, and they were also given vitamin D treatment. Next slide, please. Again, going back to the European criteria for nutritional support, in yellow, you can see the criteria this child met. Five criteria, insufficient intake, inability to meet 80% of their requirements, weight loss, change in growth trajectory, and a tricep skin fold thickness that was low. Next slide. So we gave a higher calorie supplement this time because there was significant growth issues and because there was an urgency. Next slide. And this urgency is related to the relationship between oncology patients and their nutritional status. This work published in the last two years is in, uh, illustrative of this, with those children with the worst nutritional status having the poorest outcome. And we see positive data in the use of all supplements in this particular category of diagnosis. Next slide. We also used a higher calorie formula this time because the child had a low appetite and had poor volume tolerance. Next slide, please. We see from this recent work undertaken in Indonesia, in neuroblastoma patients, that the presence of a low appetite is very common. And we see from the systematic review that there is a positive correlation between compliance with oral supplements and energy density. So for these two reasons, it was important we give a high calorie intake in a low volume because of the child's low appetite and because of the urgency. Next slide, please. In terms of follow-up, the guideline would normally suggest we follow these children up monthly. But what's important is we take into account the level of concern um, based on the child's clinical condition. So in this case, we took it more frequently. We took weight, weekly weight measurements until the child had stability. Next slide. Six months later, we saw the child had had successful treatment for their oncology and they had a positive response in terms of their weight. The decision was made on reassessment to continue the oral supplement that was still contributing largely to the child's intake. Next slide, please. So we have decisions to make based on our one calorie or 1.5 calorie per meal feeds. And in my two case studies, I've given you examples of each. Next slide. Here we see the criteria that you may want to consider for your decision. Next slide, please. The lower calorie formulas may be more for mild to moderate concerns to support nutritional status. There's a higher calorie formulas may be required for more moderate to severe concerns and very much related to recovering nutritional status. In particular, these higher calorie formulas are useful when there is an urgency to catch up or when there are higher baseline calorie requirements. In the yellow box here, you see it may be more suitable to use one calorie per meal when there are standard baseline calorie requirements, like in picky eating, or for example, in children with neurological uh, disorders. Next slide, please. So for example, if we look across many chronic conditions, we see there is higher calorie requirements and higher protein requirements. But in certain conditions, next slide, please, we see, for example, in neurological conditions, next slide, that it may be that the calorie requirements are lower 
that the requirement for protein and micronutrients is as high as any other child. Therefore, it's particularly important to ensure nutrient density to the calories that are being delivered. Next slide, please. So finally, I just wanted to share with you what I have learned through our own successes and what I've learned through our mistakes in the best ways to maximize success with oral supplements in children. The first thing I would suggest would be to always focus on what's important for the child. When we're asking a child to take a supplement, telling them that it would help with their weights will mean very little to them. And therefore it will not be a high motivator. Whereas telling a child that this supplement will help them have more energy to play more, will give them more strength, will help them do better at school, will help them concentrate, would help them feel better. These are all motivators for the child. So it's important we tell the child why it's going to help them. The second step is first impressions really matter. I have learned that the way the supplements are presented to children with the correct packaging and in a positive way is really very important. The third key point I would say is to pick the moment. I've certainly learned that the best time for children to try supplements may not be with you in your clinic setting. We often see better success when the child is in their own environment at home, where they can drink the supplement from their own cup and when they don't have people watching them. And because the first impressions really matter and the first taste matters, having a good environment where the child feels safe and feels comfortable can maximize your success. And lastly, to set targets, to be realistic with children, suggesting children that they try the supplement for a week and then they decide whether they're happy to carry on or not. We do see children who, who for example, do better with the setting targets than indefinite use of supplements. Next slide, please. So, Thank you again for your attention. It has been a real privilege to join you today. I want to re-emphasize my four key messages for you. The first, that screening is really important and it can really help us to identify children at risk of undernutrition. The second message I've got for you to remember is of course that we need to think very carefully that the comprehensive assessment that we do for children is key. And following an ABCD approach or any systematic approach to correctly and holistically assess the nutritional intake is very important. That third key message that we need to consider not just calories, but we need to consider micronutrients is really very important to optimize growth. And lastly, that we need to choose and use our nutritional interventions we have carefully. And in particular, we can use oral supplements efficiently and effectively allow for catch-up growth in children who start them in the right patients. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to take any questions uh, that you may have at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, for your comprehensive uh, explanation. I would like to invite again uh, Dr. Keith because now we are uh, coming to the question and answer. Uh, before, there are many questions about it. Yeah, for you, but also for you. Okay. But first, I'd like to ask uh, Muhammad uh, to uh, give your question. Both of them two doctors or two therapists. Okay, please, Dr. Muhammad. Please ask, ask you. Dr. Muhammad, are you there? If not, I will call you to Dr. Doctor who would like to ask. Dr. Sisra or Dr. Muhammad? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, give 
questions from the audience? The first is from Dr. Hani. Uh, Dr. Titis, ask the question straight. Uh, I think you can uh, understand it. So both of you speak uh, comment about it. If um, uh, a mom breastfeeding and she is in the diet, Uh, what do you think about the protein and iron? Uh, is it enough? And do you have suggestion for the For sometimes they have their own but the changes. And do you think the second question for this doctor? Do you think that the vegan diet is proper to a child? And what do you think what age can follow the vegan diet? Yeah, okay. So, <coughs> okay. Thank you, Ben. Um, so, um, uh, that's a very, uh, they're very interesting, and very insightful questions. Thank you. I think in terms of the vegan diet, this is something that we're seeing increasingly and I think we have to recognize that, you know, and I think we there are some nutritional reasons is that the experience there in the developing children that I can uh, share with the organizers that the team particularly to the future. Checking the relevant nutrients are adequate. The calcium, the B vitamins, IOD, and I think it's very important that families understand that there is just more than one nutrient that they need to consider if their child is following a vegan diet. And for them to recognize the role that nutrients play in not just child's growth, which is easy to see and assess, but their cognitive function, which is harder to see and understand. So I think the key is it can be used in children, but it needs to be done so with a lot of care and a lot of attention to the key nutrients that run low. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, untuk Dr. Pitis, uh, pertanyaan ini saya gabung dengan pertanyaan Dr. Dia. Ya, apakah di pekan ini uh, bisa diberikan pada anak? umur berapa kalau misalnya orang tuanya uh, memiliki kepercayaan yang harus mengikuti uh, vegan uh, solusinya bagaimana dan pertanyaan yang lain dari dokter dia pemberian zat tanpa pemeriksaan HB sebaiknya mulai dari usia berapa apakah cukup Periksa HB, MCV, MCHC, atau sampai TI. Silahkan, Dr. Titis. Sengaja saya enggak. Uh, yeah. Ya, baik. Terima kasih, Prof. Pramita. Uh, mengenai vegan, uh, kalau misalnya memang uh, karena kepercayaan dan tidak bisa diubah, uh, memang kita harus lakukan uh, suplementasi. Tetapi memang tidak disarankan untuk anak di bawah 2 tahun untuk melakukan vegan. Karena uh, sumber protein uh, dari hewan, uh, hewan ini itu adalah asam aminonya lebih lengkap. Sehingga uh, kita harus menambahkan uh, beberapa hal. Utamanya adalah zat besi, B12 juga. Ya. Uh, kemudian kita juga ingat bahwa 
uh, polong-polongan atau kacang-kacangan mempunyai zat yang menghambat penyerapan zat besi. Jadi requirement-nya akan lebih tinggi. Lalu uh, beberapa perkumpulan dietitian dan uh, pediatrician di uh, Eropa dan di Amerika menyatakan bahwa uh, kalaupun memang harus E, karena masalah agama dan kepercayaan itu harus didampingi oleh e, minimal dietitian untuk e, memastikan bahwa semuanya terpenuhi dengan baik. Ya. Kemudian mengenai kapan kita melakukan pemeriksaan e, untuk screening terpenuhi, baiknya adalah pada yang cukup bulan sebelum satu tahun antara 9 sampai 12 bulan kalau kita lihat dari AAP adalah melakukan screening uh, adanya defisiensi terbesi. Tetapi pada prematur, kalau dilihat tadi bahwa pada 6 bulan itu saja uh, prevalensi uh, defisiensi terbesinya sudah tinggi, demikian pula pada satu tahun. Jadinya itu tidak berbeda pada yang very low birth weight atau yang uh, normal weight, artinya adalah SMK ya. Nah, kemudian uh, apakah pemeriksaannya hanya habis saja dulu saja tidak bisa, kenapa? Karena kita harus memastikan bahwa apakah memang uh, anak ini mengalami defisiensi terbesi. Karena kita ingat bahwa kita mempunyai prevalensi talasemia beta yang cukup tinggi. Ya. Kemudian uh, juga sekalian Prof. Pamita kalau boleh saya menjawab mengenai apakah perlu E, membedakan pada e, anemia karena penyakit kronis atau inflamasi tentu saja kita bisa lihat apakah e, dari ferritinnya dia tinggi atau tidak karena ferritin itu adalah juga e, bereaksi cepat kalau memang ada inflamasi atau e, infeksi jadi itu juga bisa menjadi indikator apakah kita berhadapan dengan anemia defisiensi besi atau bukan Lalu yang paling sederhana dengan gambaran darah tepi, MCV, MCH, MCHC juga bisa membantu kita untuk uh, menetapkan apakah paling tidak adalah kita curiga apakah memang anemia defisiensi atau bukan. Uh, memang beberapa lab tidak mengeluarkannya karena uh, tidak diminta, tetapi idealnya kita harus meminta supaya itu akan memudahkan kita untuk mem interpretasi demikian dokter eh, proper minta terima kasih terima kasih dokter Titis karena ini ada beberapa pertanyaan yang tumpang tindih dan uh, saya rasa uh, dokter Mira Dewi dan dokter Fitri ya dokter Pia dokter Tania uh, pertanyaannya jelas ya uh, karena Titis menjawabnya satu paket hanya saja ada tambahan dokter Titis ketika pasien ini datangnya usia sekolah Betul. ya jadi kan udah miss tuh udah miss selama uh, misalnya dia paut gitu ya kira-kira uh, idealnya tiap berapa tahun kita screening besi apakah regularly ini pertanyaan ya uh, prevalensi zat besi itu uh, tinggi pada anak di bawah lima tahun dan nantinya pada uh, adolesen atau remaja Uh, permulaan remaja adalah 10 tahun pada 9 tahun pada uh, perempuan dan 11 tahun pada laki-laki. Jadi uh, prevalensi anemia banyak terjadi karena anak itu asupannya kurang kemudian terjadi menstruasi. Jadi pada periode-periode di mana anak sudah mulai menstruasi dengan asupan yang tidak memadai mungkin ada baiknya dilakukan uh, pengecekan. Lalu sebelum itu bagaimana sebetulnya dengan memastikan uh, diversitas atau variasi dari makanan sebetulnya kita bisa juga uh, agak yakin gitu ya bahwa asupannya cukup uh, sementara lossnya atau yang kebuang tidak ada. Hmm, pada waktu remaja uh, terdapat uh, loss dalam hal ini menstruasi yang sedikit banyak me membuat um, kondisinya lebih uh, jelek. Ada sekitar 20% anak SMP di Jakarta 
perempuan yang mengalami defisiensi zat besi. Belum tentu anemia, tetapi defisiensi zat besi. Itu yang eh, yang terjadi, jadi mungkin itu menjadi eh, kewaspadaan kita untuk memeriksakannya. Mungkin demikian, eh, Prof. Kita. Ya, eh, kemudian ada lagi terkait eh, tata laksana, karena ada yang berdasarkan IDAI 2011, Dan ada berdasarkan angka kecukupan gizi atau apa, di mana ada perbedaan ketika eh, apa namanya ya kalau menurut saya sih mirip ya, tapi saya sampaikan dokter Titis katanya kalau AKG itu 1 sampai dua tahun 7 miligram, namun idai eh, tetap 2 miligram. Jadi kira-kira mana yang di dokter titis? 2 miligram per kilo ya dok ya? Kilo. Ya, prof. Ya. ya. Uh, uh, menurut saya uh, mungkin kita ikuti saja IDAI. Kenapa? Karena uh, saya tahu bahwa teman-teman di Satgas sudah melakukan review terhadap uh, pustakaan yang ada uh, di dunia, baik negara yang berkembang maupun uh, negara yang sudah ber- Uh, yang belum berkembang, kemudian di, uh, dicocokkan dengan kondisi saat ini. Sementara AKG lebih ke arah komunitas, memang, uh, jadi lebih luas lagi. Saya sih sarankan kita sebagai uh, dokter anak yang berpraktek sehari-hari um, tidak komunitas konteksnya, gunakan uh, yang ada di IDES. Demikian, oke. Okay. Terima kasih. Mr. Smith, you are talking about um, uh, the, the need for iron of uh, conditions. And what do you think about the for, uh, iron fight uh, you should give to a child from what, two years old? Do you follow the 2 milligram per or is the uh, only 7 milligram per day? Uh, that's a good question. So we would normally start at the 2 milligram. I think the key thing that we've learned is about being sure of a response. So the doses may change based on the level when we retest the blood marker. Mm-hmm. We recognize that for some children, their resolution with their iron deficiency may be quick and efficient. But for other children, there may be slower responses that require higher doses. I think we also increasingly recognize the importance of checking compliance with the families. Whilst most families are compliant with the medical doses that are given, we have to recognize that there are some families where they may miss doses or there may be big delays starting the doses. So when we come to reassess their iron status, we need to have open conversations with the family about how reliable they've been at giving the dose before we consider increasing it. Okay, thank you. And there is a question for you, uh, uh, Smith. Um, what is your opinion? What is the best tool to assess nutritional status in cancer patient with organomegaly? It's from Dr. Corey. Okay, so that is a that is a very nice question. So, as we mentioned in my talk earlier on, there has been the development of uh, several new screening tools in the last few years, and one of these screening tools, the PRAT, is based on etiology. And so I think that in certain conditions where we see a range of different nutritional statuses, using 
etiology based nutrition screening tools may be may be best. I think when it comes to oncology patients, however, screening tools are we have to recognise their limitation, and that for lots of our oncology patients, the most important thing is for them to have a formal nutritional assessment. A screening may not be particularly effective in this patient group because of altered body compositions, because of uh, large organs, because of treatment pathways. So in that particular group, many would argue that, that, that all oncology patients should go to the next level of an assessment or consideration of assessment as standard. So a very nice question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Prof. Pramita, yeah. can I uh, edit some yeah. uh, about um, this question? I think uh, we, we can use the uh, mid-arm circumference for the organomegaly uh, patient uh, to use to uh, um, determine the uh, nutritional status, but yes, uh, body composition and uh, indirect calorimetry to uh, measure the exact um, calorie for the patient is the best uh, choice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Titis, uh, because uh, body composition we don't have in our department, we have to, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, and um, this question for Dr. Titis, however, I think uh, uh, Mr. has some comment about it. So, uh, about the absorption of iron plus vitamin D in uh, uh could it be effective because there are or there is mineral competitor in the platform uh, such as zinc and calcium? Uh, Dr. S uh, Mr. Smith probably would like to add some about it. Sorry, could you, uh, I lost you yeah. then. Uh, could you just repeat the question for me, please? Okay, so uh, this question is from Dr. Mervin uh, about the absorption of iron in milk formula. Could it be effective since the, there is a mineral type competitor in milk formula such as zinc and calcium? Yes. So. This is, a, this is a very good question and this is a very good point mm -hmm. uh, and it's correct because certainly in the UK we see children who have a high consumption of dairy milk having a high association of low iron due to the impact of absorption. However, in the iron that is present in many formula milks, the absorption has been shown to be quite effective. I think it's important that we recognize that the most effective form of adequate iron is for it to come from a variety and a diversity of sources. Therefore, relying on iron supplemented milk as the only source of iron, given its impact and absorption, may not be best. And it may be useful to consider there is a benefit of iron in milk, but encouraging iron-rich foods is essential within that. Okay, thank you. Probably Dr. Titi would add to add some comment. Yeah, uh, 
vitamin C and calcium in the formula, I think they uh, already uh, calculate about the uh, competition of the micronutrient. But uh, yes, the sources of uh, micronutrient is the best, uh, not from the formula, but uh, other than a formula. Uh, for those who uh, drink higher than uh, 600 uh, ml per day uh, then we think about the uh, iron uh, deficiency probably thank you uh, prof yeah okay thank you dr titis uh, this is a question for you dr titis yeah. uh, what is the uh, when is the exact time to uh, measure the iron profile in patient with infection? Okay. Um, yeah. I think it is best to uh, resolve or uh, uh, manage the infection first, and then you can check the uh, uh, iron profile. Yeah. But sometimes uh, we cannot uh, do that, uh, then we should uh, focusing in uh, uh, compare the uh, um, level of the ferritin and also after base reaction uh, level. So we can um, determine that uh, the child has uh, infection, uh, severity of infection or not. So we can uh, give the patient the uh, iron supplementation or uh, therapeutic uh, iron for uh, the deficiency. I think that's okay. And uh, the other question in regards to the uh, question, if we found that the patient have the iron deficiency and however he or he uh, long of antibiotic access in tuberculosis what do you think uh, about the iron therapy it should be cancelled or, or wait for the uh, tuberculosis drug in it or what uh. From the literature and the research, uh, the uh, uh, tuberculosis patient with iron uh, deficiency, anemia have um, um, first uh, prognosis. So it is better to uh, treat uh, tuberculosis and uh, anemia deficiency, uh, iron anemia deficiency. So. Uh, for the mild uh, cases, probably it's better to uh, treat uh, tuberculosis first and then uh, deficiency, iron deficiency anemia later on. Okay, thank you. So, what do you think, Smith, uh, Mr. Smith? Is it the same in UK for this kind of tuberculosis uh, child? You agree with uh, Dr. Tit, I think. Absolutely, I think that was a that was a fantastic answer. I got that. Yeah, I would agree. So, because there is an, another question for you uh, from Aldo again. Okay, since various vitamin uh, micronutrients are already found in most formula bodies, what is the role of giving a multivitamin to children growth? or malnutrition who are using their formula. Okay, so so yes, thank you, Bob. That is a, a very good question about the role of additional vitamin supplementation. So if the child is already receiving a formula which has good nutrient density, then it is unlikely that an additional vitamin will be required. However, 
if a child has a clear identified deficiency, for example, an iron or a zinc deficiency, then these need specific treatment. So we would not use a fortified formula as a diagnostic uh, intervention. I think what's most important would be the assessment for that child individually, looking at where and what individual nutrients are given by that formula milk and ensuring that that is adequate. We do occasionally use uh, multivitamin and minerals in addition to children on fortified formulas, but normally this is after they've been uh, thoroughly assessed and that this is indicated. It's not something we do as a standard. Okay. So, Dr. Titis, do you have a comment about this? Yeah, I agree. Uh, it is tailor-made and individual uh, assessment. So, we should uh, assess first and then uh, decide whether we should uh, adding a more uh, micronutrient uh, for the child. Because uh, usually uh, the uh, formula uh, made for the uh, healthy child, yeah, not specific for uh, such as a particular uh, disease. Thank you. Okay, I think in uh, Mr. Smith, uh, what is flow chart? It depends on the seating. If there is a need to uh, for not another uh, assessment in regards to uh, clinical whether the patient uh, are busy, so probably we uh, look for that. Okay. And uh, yeah. Oh, there is a second question from Dr. Abdul. As a pediatrician, how is the formula selection for patients under six months with growth faltering on nutrition and are not ready to re receive complementary feeds? I think um, it could not, he or he could not have a lesson. Okay, so I mean, from from the UK perspective, no six months, yeah. So below, below six months. Yes, yeah. Ricky. <laughs> yeah. Um. So the assessment of that child certainly in the UK would would centre around their centile movement. So if we'd seen a child move more than two centile spaces to the normal birth weight and they were under six months, then we would be considering a nutrient-dense formula um, for that patient. Um, certainly in terms of your second part of the question, um, who are not ready to receive complementary feed. Yes, yeah, so if the child had started solids, we would be encouraging energy dense solids and um, focusing on higher fat content to try and correct it. But if the child had not started solids and had growth failure, then correct protein energy ratio formula feeds, for example, that had at least 9% protein energy ratio to support optimal rates and composition of that weight gain would be what we would be intervening with. Okay. Yeah, from, from, uh, can I uh, add something? Please. Yeah. Uh, don't forget to uh, see the red flag and potential etiology because uh, under one uh, year, usually they have a certain uh, etiology to uh, minimize. Uh, probably not only uh, because of the limited calorie but also uh, probably the anatomical uh, or disease. Yes. 
Okay, thank you. So the time is running out. I think I will pick what a uh, tricky question. Um, it is from Dr. Christian to, to Mr. Smith. What is your opinion? Is there any room for probiotic as an adjuvant therapy to help iron absorption in anemic children? <laughs> I mean, this is an excellent question. Yeah. But I think we, we simply don't know the answer to it. I mean, I've seen some very interesting and very encouraging work in this field, which is exciting. But I think we can't draw any conclusions at this point based on the, the data that we have. I think pro and prebiotics are exciting interventions. But I think the limited data that we have on them uh, is uh, is the limiting factor for us using them in clinical practice. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what, uh, what 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 you think too. Yeah, I agree with uh, you because uh, it is still a controversial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Probably we should have another meeting about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think it's uh, two minutes more. Um, so, what do you think about the uh, screen tools? You said that at, uh, since 2018, there are three screening tools. I use PNSS and uh, PRAT. What is uh, what is the best? Because there is another question from other doctor. The best means easily to practice for parents. Okay. Um, the parents. The parents. So I think uh, this is a good question. So I think there is a definite role for parents to be monitoring their own children and I think we have to recognize the, the measurements such as length and measurements such as head circumference which are very important in assessment are most accurately done by professionals who've been trained and who are regularly doing it mm -hmm. and measurements by parents are, are often a little bit less accurate there is weight if the weight is taken on the same scales at home at a regular time point, then this is a very effective way of parents tracking their child's growth, uh, which is more reliable. So I would say the key points to parents' involvement would be consistency of the scales that they use, not weighing their child too often, and being cautious about the accuracy of other anthropometric markers like height and head circumference that require a little bit more skill. Okay. Uh, Dr. Pitis, do you want to add something? Yeah, uh, growth monitoring is uh, the best tool to uh, know whether uh, our child is a faltering or a normal uh, growth. Uh, but. Uh, Screening tool for the uh, uh, ill patient. Uh, usually, we are in Jakarta. We use the uh, strong kit, uh, Chris, not PSM or uh, others, uh, as the uh, uh, first line to screen whether the the child have uh, certain um, or specific. Uh, additional uh, nutritional uh, support or not so probably the the, the question is uh, very very um, common question yeah. so uh, the parent can uh, answer uh, directly so it is not uh, 
a difficult a question to know whether uh, the child have uh, certain um, modality to to uh, Sorry. Hello. Could you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, Tonkit. Uh, we use Tonkit as a, a screening tool in our hospital to know whether the patient uh, already have a certain condition that. Uh, should uh, support in uh, uh, nutrition, and uh, we 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 modify from the original, so it is uh, easier for uh, our uh, health worker to uh, to question the parents. Yes. Okay. So because this is the end of this session, so I would like to uh, make a summary. I will talk in Bahasa, pardon me, Mr. Uh, Smith. Ya. Uh, jadi kalau kita sudah sama-sama mendengar presentasi yang sangat menarik dari dua pembicara hari ini, ya. Dokter Titis telah uh, memperlihatkan secara um, komprehensif tentang uh, defisiensi sebagai Salah satu etiologi yang penting terjadinya growth faltering pada bayi dan uh, masa kanak-kanak. Ya. Kita sebagai uh, spesialis anak terutama harus aware, tadi sudah begitu indahnya diperlihatkan, uh, bahwa stunting ini mas, uh, merupakan masalah kita nomor 4 di dunia tahun 2018. Dan Presiden Jokowi, bulan Januari 2021 pada saat uh, acara di Istana Negara menghendaki tahun 2024 turun 14 persen. Padahal kalau kita tahu sebelumnya 2013 ke 2018 penurunannya hanya sekitar uh, kira-kira 7 persen. Ya? Dan uh, ini sesuatu yang uh, PR besar bagi kita semua bahwa 2024 artinya dalam tiga tahun ke depan, kita harus benar-benar bisa menurunkan stunting. Uh, defisiensi uh, FA ini salah satu yang uh, kita bicarakan hari ini sebagai salah satu kontributor uh, besar untuk terjadinya stunting. Uh, tadi juga dokter uh, Mr. Smith telah memberikan uh, bagaimana caranya bahwa screening itu penting. Tetapi begitu banyak screening, banyak batasan, uh, tadi beliau juga mengungkapkan bahwa di Eropa uh, pemakaian screening diperlihatkan sejak tahun 2000 sampai 2008 menjadi perubahan. Tetapi mungkin kita sebagai anggota IDAI, kita akan uh, mengikuti anjuran uh, UKK, ya, dalam hal ini seperti uh, sebagai ketua UKK, NPM, nutrisi dan penyakit metabolik. Ya. Uh, tentunya pada kondisi tertentu, asat yang tadi sudah dikemukakan dengan baik oleh Mr. Smith dapat kita gunakan, mungkin begitu terpetitis. Dan uh, tadi yang penting adalah uh, kuncinya, kita selalu mengakses setelah melakukan kompetitif evaluasi yang dianalisis. Tadi ada uh, cara ABCD yang menurut saya itu sesuatu yang sebenarnya kita lakukan sehari-hari berarti kita sama dengan Eropa ya, antropometri, background and biochemistry, clinical and dietary nah, di clinical ini kita curiga ada defisiensi FK nah, tidak dijumpai adanya kelainan organik diantaranya tanda-tandanya adalah ada GER ya, atau reflux patologis adanya kelainan jantung adanya kelainan paru-paru untuk aspirasi. Ya, jadi tadi eh, bagus sekali dari kedua 
pembicaraan telah dibicarakan secara komprehensif. Uh, selebihnya asal para sejawat sekalian sudah mendengarkan informasi yang sangat baik, komprehensif dari dokter maupun dokter uh, saya tidak akan menambahkan lagi. Dan I would like to thanks uh, Dr. Titis and also uh, Mr. Smith for your uh, both of you and beautiful aspect yeah, in iron deficiency. And I think we learned uh, plenty about it from etiology and how to manage, how to screen. And I do hope uh, this afternoon we learn uh, how to improve our practice in daily practice, especially to prevent the stunting or correct the stunting, because we have a homework from our president. We have to reduce the stunting uh, in 50% from nowadays that we have a preference. So I think very much. Yeah, sorry, Hussain for uh, support this meeting and I would like to invite Dr. Pesani to uh, continue or close this meeting. Dr. Pesani? Baik, terima kasih kepada Profesor Dr. Dr. Pramita Gayatri, spesialis anak konsultan yang sudah memandu sesi ilmiah pada siang hari ini. Uh, saya ucapkan terima kasih juga untuk Dr. Titis Pramita Sari, spesialis anak konsultan. Terima kasih dok atas materinya dan diskusinya yang sangat menarik. And we would like to thank Mr. Chris Smith, a registered dietitian, Bachelor of Science and BDA, for a very comprehensive presentation and also for the interesting discussion today. Dan alhamdulillah mudah-mudahan sudah terjawab pertanyaan dari